What's going on, everybody? Welcome in to the Monday, April 8th, 2024 edition of the Daily Energy News Beat Stand Up. Here are today's top headlines. First up, California emits more greenhouse gas than all other U.S. states combined, keeping on our favorite state California theme. The next article is why gas prices in California have gone ballistic. We'll then move over to one of our favorite sub stacks, the energy bad boys, wind drought blackout. Do you feel lucky punk? (laughs) A really great, um, um, a cover art here. That'll be great to see next up critical impact. Jat GPT consumes 500 milliliters of water for every 50 texts you send through it interesting i love this angle here because we talk a lot about power not that much about water and then in all irony april 8th solar eclipse will briefly limit solar electricity generation across the country i, I had to i you can't make to. this stuff up folks <laughs> we will then toss it over to me i will quickly cover what happened in the oil and gas markets on friday oil popped tremendously we'll cover some of the reasons behind that we also got an insight into u.s rig counts and our favorite one of our favorite oil uh, journalists, Javier Blayas, he wrote a great piece for Bloomberg that we'll cover titled Exxon $60 billion fight with Chevron will reshape big oil all about the Guyana. I will cover all that in a bag of chips. Guys, as always, I am Michael Tanner, joined by the creator of EnergyNewsBeat.com, Stuart Turley. Go ahead and kick us off. Where do you want to begin? Hey, let's start out with our buddies over there in California. California emits more greenhouse gases than all of the other states combined. Are you shocked, Michael? I'm not shocked at all that Newsom's behind this. Oh, yeah. And Oil Slick, if he gets in the hot tub, ooh, it goes out into the bay. Okay, hang on. I did not know what this was talking about. It is not oil and gas. It, the research conducted by a team from Johns Hopkins University in collaboration with NOAA, so you know that it's really on the on the mark there. And they and Scripps Institute of Oceanography analyzed fifteen thousand air emission of sulfur fluoride collected from two thousand fifteen to two thousand nineteen. And it's because of what they are doing. 85% of the state's emissions stems from the process of uh, structural fumigation. This practice involves sealing infested structures with airtight tents, introducing gas to eliminate pests, and venting it into the atmosphere. Well, Well, where's the bill to eliminate the insects now? Where's the bill? That's the next thing that should come up in the legislature. Get rid of all grasshoppers. Uh, you got to eat them. I mean, you know, Claude Schwab is going to want food us. Source. What are we going to eat now? You will eat nothing and be happy. I'd like to have a grasshopper. Thank you. No, this is absolutely hypocrisy at its finest. The yep. study highlights proactive approach to greenhouse gas reduction and emphasizes the importance of informed strategies. Yes. Do you want cockroaches and bugs? close the border if you want to have you know this is just unbelievable (laughs) yeah it's you you can't make this stuff up and the fact that the majority of it comes from non-oil and gas which is also again another another one of our favorite hypocrisies is 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 hilarious uh you said it best this is energy hypocrisy at its finest let's move to gas prices oh you gotta love this one let's go let's keep going there uh why gas prices in california have gone ballistic you gotta love a good ballistic story the golden state average at the pump surges 23 cents to 527 per gallon on friday from a week ago according to the uh AAA. um Tom Closa, head of the energy analysis at OPSIS, refinery challenges the main culprit for California's surging prices. Challenges? I call it a shotgun to the crotch is what I call it. Throw in regularly scheduled maintenance that will occur at two critical refineries in May and the normal pennant uh, for speculative buying in global markets in the second quarter, and you have wholesale prices that have gone ballistic. 
I guarantee you, you're going to see more and more diesel and gasoline being bought from Michael. Hold on. Hold on. China. Through Russia. Uh, no, they're buying it from China. You heard it here second. First, you heard it here in first from Newsom and President Z in California. Any student of petroleum history recognizes that these relationships won't persist, said Clausa. A correction for gasoline and perhaps crude looms, and it also will occur in the next 30 days. It is absolutely abysmal what they're doing. Oh, yeah. I mean, they, they don't want people to drive. This is legislation through regulation. I had an opportunity to go to a great event uh, hosted by um, Texans. I It, it was... Uh, who Genevieve Collins? Who is she part uh, of? Um, Americans for Prosperity. Americans for Prosperity. Uh, aren't they're she a Texas great? based. She's a yes. great, great person. I had an opportunity to go to an event hosted by them where Congressman Austin Fluger, who's a, the congressman for Midland Odessa, great guy. We need to get him on the podcast. And RT Trevino. We love RT. He's the he's a president of Trevino Family Resources, Pecos Country Operating. He had an opportunity to have two minutes in front of the congressman, and I'm so glad he did this. He sounded exactly like used to. He pointed out that small operators and, 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 and small businesses are getting regulated out of business because of all this stuff. And this is exactly, this goes into exactly what they're talking about. They're trying to add in more taxes, more regulations, more things that make ga gasoline more expensive. So there's the, o the, only, the only place you're going to end up going to get gas is a California national gas station. Owned by President Z and Newsom. Yep, yep. A, a, a joint venture between California and China. That if I ever have to cover that on the deal spotlight, I'm just jumping. I'm just gonna go jump out the window. I'm on do the third remember, floor of an apartment. I'm just gonna dive in head first. Do you remember three years ago when you and I were covering the tanker shortages and they were lined up in the bay? Mm -hmm. and China says. You all know uh, what going on. And they wanted to come on our show. They wanted to interview us for the China mainland TV. Do you remember that? Yeah, because on uh, because <laughs> on top of being Putin's political advisor, you're also Xi, you know, President Xi's no, political they, advisor. They they were like, he taught truth. <laughs> <laughs> What's next? Let's go to the energy uh, bad boys. Uh, energy bad boys. I'll tell you what. This I, I actually love these guys. When uh, drought uh, blackout, do you feel lucky? Punk the energy bad boys. Uh, this one, there are two videos in here. The first video is a fluff piece from when a large transitional power plant goes offline. And Michael, it's a fluff piece where you feel good. There's unicorns and fairy dusk and mm. Tinkerbell. One windmill wakes up, another one goes to sleep. That's not how a grid works. I'm over here going, eh. yep. if you if you go down in the article, you'll see Clint Eastwood going, hey, do you feel lucky, punk? This is the 44 mag with the most powerful handgun in the world. And did I shoot five or did I shoot six? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> that funny the grid is going on right now we call this dirty hairy energy policy do you feel lucky i i absolutely thought it was great there's actually wind drought they've been there's a chart in there if miss producer if you could bring this up wind uh capacity factor for all uh mismo january through february and you can see that the chart has as it dies down Coal and natural gas stepped into the breach to keep the lights on. If we did not have natural gas, and Michael, this goes into an excellent point on ERCOT. Mer uh, MISMO is up uh, in the center part of the uh, uh, state. It's the uh, in the in the grid operator. ERCOT is in Texas. Mm -hmm. ERCOT has half the price because of the ability of foreign investment in the natural gas. We have Total Energy investing in the natural mm -hmm. gas plants in Texas. That big money allows us to also have a balance of everything in there. You don't have that in this one. Okay, so let's, yeah, let's come get, in here. Like, you start advising President Xi to buy up some natural gas in Texas. What could we want more? I be don't better? want his money. What I could just, be better? 
Uh, or an investment in our energy infrastructure. <laughs> what could go wrong? What could go wrong? They already own a lot of the farmland, and then they're going to never mind. Okay. The oh, yeah, that, is, and that's great. No, I'm pumped about that. I'm not. Believe me, I'm going to go finish mine. Let's go to the next story here. Critical impact. Chat GPT consumes 500 milliliters of water for every 50 texts you send it. Miss uh, Producer, could you call this picture up? I about threw up when I actually saw this one. There, it, it is a gr gruesome looking picture. Uh, for our podcast listeners, it is a uh, modern looking C3PO that actually looks kind of scary with a human looking tongue drinking some water. So that's got to be a cyborg looking kind of a thing. Um, but anyway, that was generated by chat GPT. So if you're not thirsty before, or after but before you see that you are thirsty after looking at that scary thing here's where it gets really scary um sean wren a researcher at the university of california riverside and the one of the authors of the paper cited saying that training gpt3 in microsoft state-of-the-art u.s data centers used 700,000 liters of clean fresh water but the real problem is going to come when the public becomes increasingly obsessed with asking their ai assistance questions um and so that's a lot. And when you well, here's what it, this is the scariest part. The paper goes on to say that global AI demand, do, you know, forecasted, obviously global AI demand may mean that we draw between 4.2 and 6.6 .6 billion cubic meters. And that's three. That's that's multiply that by three because you're talking about meters to feet. OK, because this is a UK study. So 4.2 yeah. to 6.6 .6 billion cubic meters of water in 2027, which is half of the current water use in the uk oh you think there's a drought now you ain't seen nothing yet which is re i had when i read this article i was like i had no idea i didn't either and it just absolutely abounds it's scary the only way ai is going to work michael is nuclear period mm -hmm. But you still need to cool it. I came across an interesting company re recently, Hedge Resources, that has a modular uh, Bitcoin mine that they cool it using the produced water from an oil well, and it evaporates. So not only do you not have to use fresh water, but you can also save on your produced water costs. Instead of having to truck it off, you just pipe it, pipe it through a Bitcoin mine, and it evaporates towards the end. That We're going to have to innovate like, Things like that are going to have to become more mainstream in order for this stuff to work. I need to I need to visit with him on the podcast. I want to learn more about. That. Yes, we'll get you hooked up, uh, Chris and Andrew over there. Very very, very great guys. But no, we're, you're going to the market's going to have to come up with solutions like that to solve this problem because this is a this is a second third order effect that everyone's talking about electricity. Nobody's talking about water. Oh no, water's huge. And especially when you get Coward Schwab up there going, you will have no water and be happy. Honestly, yeah, he, he said that. Uh, April, solar eighth eclipse will briefly limit solar electrical generation across the country. This one kind of caught my attention since today is April. Day before the eclipse. <laughs> Pilot, you're listening to this on the 8th. You're listening to this on the 8th. Here's the uh, let me just read this one last the last paragraph in here. The effect of the 2017 solar eclipse on the system was minor. Since then, however, the U.S. electric electricity portfolio has changed significantly. Almost 100 gigawatts of utility scale solar and small scale solar capacity has been added to the system. During the 2017 solar generation was the fifth leading generation energy source in the United States behind natural gas, coal, nuclear, and hydro. Even with the eclipse, we're expected solar generation to be the third largest contributor of electricity in the United States behind natural gas and nuclear. Um, I don't know what to make of today, tomorrow, the future. 
<laughs> I'm here. Well, I first let's pull up this uh, this EIA graph here, the utility scale solar generation path for the eight. So you can see I'm sitting here in Dallas right now, which yep. is ironically right in the path of totality, which is interesting. You're going to get about four minutes of that. I love how they have those bands, though, from, you know, and you can kind of see. And what's crazy is a lot of the solar, as you can see, um, is, you know, a lot of that's on the East Coast is obstructed. So, again, the place where you need the electricity, Northeast, we can't get because it's all – even the solar is going to be knocked out. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, you can take a look in Oklahoma. There's very little solar. You know, it's kind of like, hmm, who cares? Uh, Louisiana. place. Yeah, there you go. You, Louisiana, there's like one solar panel. Look the at North China Dakota. There's none. None. <laughs> and South Dakota, one. One. one, a two. one. <laughs> Look at Florida. It's going off into the ocean there. Isn't and that funny? There is a decent amount in, 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 in Florida. No kidding. Um, and that makes sense. But anyway, I just thought it was kind of funny. I'm seeing so many things about the, the how this is a, a spiritual thing, how this is going to have all these other. It, it's just weird, dude. Buckle up. I can't wait to if talk to you. If it's weird for that. you, that guys, that means it's off the cliff. Dude, I'm not going into any of this. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, before we hop over to finance, guys, we'll go ahead and pay the bills here. As always, thanks for checking us out um, at energynewsbeat.com. All the news and analysis analysis you just heard um, is brought to you by that website. Again, www.energynewsbeat.com. Stu and the team do a tremendous job making sure that website stays up to speed. Everything you need to know to be at the tip of the spear when it comes to the oil and gas and energy business. Check us out, dashboard.energynewsbeat.com for all of your data news combo. Um, we have a survey. Go ahead and hit that below. We appreciate everybody's feedback. As always, guys, energynewsbeat.com. As we move over to, uh, to the overall markets, actually a great day on Friday. Markets um, overall were up uh, about 1.1 percentage points for the S&P 500. NASDAQ up 1.2 percentage points. Um, Two-year yields popped. 2.2 percentage points, 10-year yield, only 2.1 percentage points. Um, dollar index, fairly flat. Bitcoin, $68,000 as it trades this weekend. Crude oil finishes on an absolute tear, 86 not, uh, 73 was that was that closing price there on Friday, up more a dollar, mainly on the back of, of, of some just forecasted supply risk between what's going on between Israel and now Iran. Stu can probably speak a little bit more, but... I ran Israel took out some generals in that Iranian generals that were in Israel, right? Uh, no, they were right. Just, they were still outside of it. They're uh, okay. outside the border, but still bad. So basically Israel or Iran came out and, and, and the quote is, um, you know, they, there's no quote, but they quote vowed revenge against Israel for well, the attack that they, killed the um, their by, top by, two generals. The, is, is this is, you know, what I mean, this is why oil prices popped. We're going to see oil prices when they, um, as you're listening to this, my, my guarantee is oil prices have risen from 86.91. Are you worried about this escalating more now, Stu, because of this move? Um, I'm going to answer, and I, I think it's intentional. And I, I think that you're going to have people like the Warhawks, like uh, Leslie Graham, or uh, Leslie Graham, are, are going to be actually happy. I, I'm serious. Uh, if, if there is a a a very big call for the warmongers to start World War Three, and this is going to do it. Yeah, I mean, so I think that's where a lot of your supply risk is also coming in. You know, part of the reason why we saw the S&P 500 and all of our, our two and 10 year yields up is because, ironically, the U.S. had some great jobs numbers drop on Friday. The U.S. economy added I theoretically 300. Sorry, let me I want to talk about that. Let me finish before you get in and dump. the U.S. economy adds on an overall number 303,000 jobs last month. That was up from an estimate. Um of 
of only about 10,000 jobs. Um, you know, mainly that robust oil demand led to a lot of those jobs coming back, considering what the rigs have happened. This may, the problem with this is that it could delay any potential interest rate cuts that were being expected by the market. So I think there was a little bit of a tempered expectations. All right. Now that we've at least read the numbers, Stu, what's your thoughts on it? I think the jobs market is absolutely abysmal. Uh, the average numbers are part-time jobs. And when you sit back and take a look and strip apart the numbers and the type of jobs, there were only, I believe, 40,000 full-time jobs created. I have to go look at the actual numbers, but there was a fraction of full-time jobs created. The other part are multiple people trying to create and hold down part-time jobs, two and three type jobs, same person working three jobs yeah. does not have a successful number and it is fictitious and they are putting out false numbers. Well, I think this has more to do with, okay, maybe there is a qu overall net gain of jobs. The problem is the economy is not in good shape due to the fact no. that inflation is still high. So the problem is the more you go and the more you 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 turn the levels of unemployment, because it's the first thing you learn as an undergrad econ student. You learn how to calculate unemployment and you realize, oh, wait. The unemployment calculation comes down with how they classify you. Are you full time? Are you looking for a job? You know, are you I mean, we all I mean, any basic economist student, you know, economic student knows this. So the fact that even if there is an overall slight net gain of jobs, the fact is them pushing this number as high as it is, is going to lead to the fact it is 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 in, you know, only going to stoke continued inflation. Now, the problem is, and this is where I find myself, you know, I want rates to go down. The problem yes. is then then you you don't fix the problem because then money gets too loose again. You almost, and, and yes, well, it's true. We, we can't continue to just keep printing money. The You know, we, we were seeing what the U.S. deficits are absolutely unbelievable right now. We could pull up the U.S. debt calculator. It'll make you puke relative to what U.S. taxpayers and what all this own. The issue is cutting rates slightly will allow the economy to start turning a little bit. Does it need to go to zero? No. Do they maybe need to be a little bit lower? I don't envy the position Jay Powell and the Fed is in because they have to balance this really. If they, you continue to bring raise rates up, inflation will continue to. You, you, the more you raise rates, you're going to get inflation under control. The problem is. The more if you keep raising it, you're going to start impacting a lot of these jobs numbers that are coming. You know, the tech industry is not doing well. We know that. But, you know, the oil field is actually seeing a boom right now, even though we're about to cover rig counts are down a little bit. So I don't envy the position the Fed's in right now. As a economist, you're an economist and a financial expert. Me, I disagree with the old school way. And I'm you're the you're the guy that actually knows something. Me. The only way you're going to change and get rid of inflation is to lower interest. No, make it zero. Don't give it away. Make it 1%, make it a half a percent, whatever you got to do, lower it and lower energy prices without lowering energy prices. Nothing you do. They can't change and get rid of inflation. You have to lower energy prices, period. And again, going back to this jobs number, they're definitely they're they're jockeying with this number because they're in an interest. The Fed's in an interesting position. They have they only have two levers they can pull, and it, it doesn't. It may even not necessarily have the effect that they want it to. But we agree on this: you have to bring down energy costs. And the problem is, energy costs are continuing to go up. We're dropping rigs. Oil's now up to the highest it's been in five months. If Miss Producer, if we can pull up the latest U.S. rig count, the U.S. dropped one rig week over week, which is absolutely insane considering rigs have continued. So what? I mean, what does this tell you? It could tell you a bunch of different stuff. Really, when you look at the breakout, there was no rigs added or dropped on both onshore or horizontal. The only thing. Oh. That we saw, um, we saw two directional ri uh, vertical rigs get picked up, and then we did see three offshore rigs drop, which is an in you know which doesn't necessarily mean one thing or the other because you're talking about active drilling. So maybe this rig was going back for a little de not decommissioning, but hey, let's refresh it up a little bit and change out, come back out here in three months. So those rigs will get picked back up. But 
we we Boy, continue. What's up? Look at the international. Wow. International's crushing. Well, it's over $90 right now. Saudi Arabia's picking. Everyone's now taking the opportunity to pick rigs up. It's interesting what's going on in the United States, though. People, and this has a lot to do with returns for shareholders. We're covering this in the deal spotlight every single week now. Is The only thing people are are are, are saying is, hey, we're going to return uh, money to shareholders, return money to shareholders. It's a far cry from the 2016s, which it was, whoa, whoa. More rigs, more rigs, more rigs. Not quite how it's working. Speaking of offshore, Stu, this is <laughs> an absolutely crazy story. Exxon's $60 billion fight with Chevron will reshape big oil. So we all know the the, the Chevron Hess um, merger, and not really a merger, Chevron purchasing Hess in an all-stock transaction worth somewhere about $60 billion, including the debt. The funny part is Hess has a huge 30% stake in the famous Guyana Starbuck or Starbroke field, which is a series of oil fields off the coast of Guyana with potentially somewhere around 11 billion barrels of oil worth about 1 trillion at current prices. The interesting part is that ExxonMobil, for those of you who don't know, about three weeks ago or about a, eh, about a month ago, came out and officially be, and officially sued to exert its right of first refusal for the guy for Hess's Guyana stake and basically kicked off a legal battle. This is a article from Javier Bl- uh, Blias. He's one of our favorite Bloomberg guys. Um, okay. you know, the center of this legal battle, as he says, hinges on the meaning of a few words contained in a highly secret document, probably about a hundred pages long. What he was able to do was be able to get a copy of a transcript that most likely was the template of the JOA used. The interesting part is this, and I find this uh, fascinating before we dive into the template. Right after the Chevron Hess deal was announced, Exxon ironically just sounded welcoming. This is a quote from Darren Woods. He told Bloomberg on October 27th, we work with Chevron all around the world. I see them in their participation and basically coming in and supporting the work. We have already demonstrated our ability to deliver on. Because remember, Exxon's the 45% interest owner. Well, obviously someone in his company said, wait a second, bro. Wait a second, Woods. You're missing something here. Because two weeks later, Woods called his counterparties. It has to say, wait, wait, there's a problem. Oh, there's a problem. Exxon argued that it had the right of first refusal for Hess's stake in Guyana, basically um, saying, hey, you can't make this merger happen until we have an opportunity to bid on these Guyana assets. The interesting part is Hess and Chevron responded by saying, while that's true, the structure of the deal negated the claim. Oh, interesting. This culminated in, remember, this was back in October, okay? So there was a four-month battle until on March 28th, Chevron filed the famous S-4 document with the Securities and Exchange Commissions detailing Exxon's concerns. And so this is when X, Chevron's got to come out and say, wait a second, there are people trying to delay this. Uh, multiple days later, um, Woods informed Hess's CEO, John Hess, and Chevron CEO, Mike Worth, that his company was suing for arbitration so really what this comes down to is the joa which is called the joint operating agreement which basically is how the deal is structured and um all of the terms that are in there um basically there's this 40 94 page contract that is used by the international energy uh, that was uh, put out by the association of international energy negotiations, which basically most likely contain the basis of the agreement between uh, Exxon and Hess. And really where wall street as Javier dives into taking the view that Exxon ironically won't win because this is a corporate deal at the parent level, which doesn't trigger preemptive rights at the, set level. Super interesting. So what does the change of control mean? Well, that's specifically what their the clause talks about. There is an interesting paragraph, though, in the template that, if used in the Starbrock JOA, might prove Exxon has a case. And now I'm quoting directly from the article, quote, change in control means any direct or indirect change in control of a party, whether through merger, sale of, uh, sale of shares, or other equity interest or otherwise, 
in which the market value of the participating's interest represents more than X percentage of the aggregate market value of the assets, such as parties and affiliates that are subjugated to change of control. For purposes of this definition, market value shall be determined upon the amount in cash a, will, a willing buyer would be would pay a willing seller in an arm's length transaction. Obviously, the percentage is blank because we don't know the actual numbers, but that's the interesting part. One of our favorite uh, oil analysts, Paul Sankey, he was quoted as saying, of the $170 that he that uh, Hess went for and Chevron Chevron used as the number to buy, about 140 of that comes from its Guyana stake. So you're talking over 75, 80% of the value comes from Guyana, which is why Exxon is like, wait a second here, we have an opportunity to bid on here. So again, this change of control clause, wherever it's written in the JOA, clearly is going to control this. Now, the funny part is this. Um, uh, Neil Chapman, I'm going to find this in the thing. Um, Neil Chapman came out, who's the CEO, who's the CFO of Exxon, and basically said, guys, 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 I don't know why you're all freaking out. We know this contract because we wrote this contract. Oh, shot to the basically saying, we know better than you. It's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out, Stu. Um, whenever you have somebody says, I wrote the contract. Mm. Hey, that doesn't matter in the court of law, though. Doesn't matter. Look, I got some jokes, but I'm going to keep us on the air and not make them. Go ahead. Keep us on the air. <laughs> um, what else you got, Stu? It's going to be a busy week. It is. Uh, we'll see how, um, how weird it gets this week. You know, we got the eclipse today, guys. Glad you're checking that out. Um, send us in your best stuff for that, but we'll go and let you guys get out in here, get back to work, take a look um, at that eclipse. For Stuart Turley, I'm Michael Tanner and the entire energynewsbeat.com family. We'll see you tomorrow, folks.